preserve our planet presented by samsung this week our planet mechanics are trying to save one of the world's most beautiful cities venice a city without roads venice is completely reliant on boats but the toxic fumes they spew are destroying its historic buildings. Dick and Jem will have to think out of the box. But can the two landlubbers clean up Venice's act? That's been running, what, five minutes? No wonder they've got problems. Or will they be up the canal without a paddle? Something's not right, to us, is it? Dick Strawbridge is an ex-army officer turned eco-warrior. Jim Stansfield is an inventor with a wild green streak. Whoa! Two men on a mission to fix the world. Whoa! One mechanical solution at a time. Oh. Together, they are the Planet Mechanics. This week, Dick and Jem have traveled to Italy to take on one of the world's most polluting forms of transport, motorboats. So they've headed to the Venice Lagoon, which is being overrun by marine traffic. As well as the 118 islands that make up the city of Venice itself, there are others out in the lagoon. And the planet mechanics will be based on one of them, La Chatosa, next to the historic city. The planet mechanics have been invited over by former Olympic sailor Alberto Sanino. Bonjour, Alberto. Hi, guys. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Welcome on board. Welcome to Certosa Island. Is this all your boatyard? Yeah, this is the Polo Nautico Vento di Venezia. It's... Whoa! <laughs> You see, Italian's very fast for us, but this is gorgeous. <laughs> what else is there here? Because obviously you've got a lot... Alberto runs a marina and boatyard that specializes in building wooden boats. And he's recently opened a hotel. He hopes that the hotel will give visitors a chance to appreciate both the city of Venice and the lagoon. But because it's on a separate island, his hotel is dependent on boats to ferry his guests to Venice, and he's worried about the pollution he's causing. Dick and Jem's challenge is to create an emissions-free water taxi that can transport up to six tourists to and from Venice and around the city. And Alberto's got the perfect place for them to get started. <laughs> it even smells like a workshop. Not only do Dick and Jem have their own workshop, but they also have full access to the rest of the boatyard. It's the perfect location for the planet mechanics. In the workshop, Dick has found a typical outboard engine used to power small boats and wants to show Jem just how bad these little motors can be. Oh, I'm going to show you something absolutely disgusting. Go on then, Dick. This little two-stroke engine is 500 times more polluting than a car engine. Clean water, yep. one engine. That's amazing. Two-stroke outboard engines are common on Venice's small boats. They run on a mixture of petrol and oil. By not separating the fuel and lubrication, the motors have fewer parts and are simpler, cheaper and lighter. It means, though, that oil is still present in the exhaust and is released into the environment, in this case, the waters of Venice. It is disgusting. I feel so much better about what we're doing. Like, I used to think it was a great idea. Now I think it's a vital idea. What amazes me is how marine pollution has somehow slipped under the radar. You look at that and you think, well, that's an enormous problem that no one seems to be talking about. That's been running, what, five minutes? There's 40,000 boats out there. No wonder they've got problems. As well as pumping out oil into the water, boat engines also pollute the air with a cocktail of carcinogenic gases like benzene, toluene and xylene. And it's not only small engines that are causing issues. The cruise ships that flock to Venice are also massively polluting. I'd love to know how much fuel those things actually use. Because you know the engines on them are bigger than this boat. Oh, yeah, you better believe They're, that. They're, like, going to be yeah. phenomenal. 
I reckon your carbon footprint crossing the Atlantic is about seven and a half times that of flying. So what, per person? Per 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 yeah, absolutely. The amount of fuel they use is seven and a half times what an aeroplane would use to get them across yeah. the Atlantic. Yes, yeah, so your whole carbon footprint. Is, but the, the other thing is, you've got to remember, it probably goes this far on a gallon. And for Venice, it's a double whammy. Because once they've arrived, they offload their tourist cargo to tour the city by yet more boats. Venice is built out of an archipelago of 118 small islands. Over 400 bridges connect them, and 150 canals are used instead of roads. As Europe's largest car-free zone, it's completely unique. There are only two ways to get around. By foot, or by boat. So Alberto has taken Dick for a tour in his traditional Venetian water taxi. In the 13th century, Venice was one of Europe's most prosperous cities. Built up as a trading post between Europe and the East, its legacy is some of the most beautiful architecture in the world. Palaces, bridges, and gondolas all help to attract 16 million tourists each year. What effect do you think the boats are having on Venice now? Obviously, they are uh, something uh, we need to use, but the effects can be can be dangerous and can be bad for, for everything, for the area, for the nature, for the historical buildings, and also for the natural things that are around the city that are very critical and very easy to be damaged by the boats. Boat engine exhaust contains sulfur dioxide, and when combined with oxygen and water, it creates sulfuric acid. And this acid is eroding away the precious facades. If these buildings are to be preserved, sulfur dioxide concentration in the air has to be reduced. As well as destroying the buildings, pollution is also killing off the people. Lung cancer and heart attacks caused by atmospheric pollution cause around 140 deaths in Venice each year. Why don't we just say no motors, no engines in Venice, more gondolas? Because uh, it's not possible to run a commercial activity or an economy activity rowing. Although there are still hundreds of gondoliers to transport tourists, they are mainly a tourist attraction themselves. And the city still relies on a fleet of water buses and taxis to move people around. Venice's boats are an environmental disaster. Back at La Chatosa, it's Dick and Jem's mission to find an alternative. What sort of things can we do? Traditionally, wind. Wind? Wind power? I can imagine trying to get wind power through those canals. <laughs> it's not going to work in Venice. He's a good sailor. I don't think he's that good. Pedalos. Pedalos are my favourite form of transport. It's like the people of Venice can now have bicycles. Forget the gondoliers, forget the pedalling power. Human power isn't going to give us enough. We need motors. How about an electric diesel hybrid? They've got the big diesel engine for when they need to go long distances, and then when they actually get into the centre of Venice, click onto the electric, mm, quietly around the canals. The normal advantage of a hybrid is you can actually regenerate going downhill. <laughs> Doesn't work in Venice. OK, so it's just electric then. We give them just an electric boat. You know, making an electric boat that's going to do what we wanted to do with these sort of distances is not easy. I've had an idea. I now think I can make an electric boat in an hour. If you can make an electric boat working in one hour, yeah. I will jump in beside you, swim along, and tell everybody you're an engineering god. Get your trunks ready, Dick. <laughs> I'm off. It's not hard to be in a man's world. We fight to rule. We fight to survive. We fight to be free. Ben Fatal, tonight, 8 p.m. on Brand New Sunday. Brought to you by SimplyMurray.com and Always With The News. Dick's skeptical that they can make an electric-powered boat, so Jem wants to make a working model to prove him wrong. He plans to power it with a radio-controlled aeroplane propeller. Using a length of steel, he's creating a prop shaft and is fixing the propeller to the end of it. 
A swivel bearing on the back of the board will locate the prop shaft and enable Jem to steer. For extra stability, he's using two bits of plywood fixed on the bottom of the board. How are we doing? Good. This is the future of electric boats, is it? I had a bit of a trouble with the boat part of it. Uh, the boats they would let me have had holes in them. Where's the power? Air uh, deck. Twiddle I'll power. I'll reveal that when we get onto the lagoon. You're going to have to tell me your cunning secret soon, you know. Don't be angry, Dick. Don't be you angry. You are joking! Some of the best battery technology you can Dick. literally lay your hands on. Look at this for an action boat. One of the tubes are going to get wet. I have a funny feeling it's going to be you and the drill. Just in case it does get wet, just for us, so we can continue the job, I'll stick it in a bag. <laughs> it's not got much buoyancy or stability. Okay. <laughs> right, okay. I'll just go for it. Okay. Oh, he moved! <laughs> Jam! You got reverse. I'm struggling with the steering a little bit. <laughs> the electric drill should provide good propulsion, but Jem's balance is letting down the design. And every time he falls in the water, the drill is increasingly at risk of being damaged. One problem that electric boats of all designs have is ensuring that the electrics and the water stay separate. Water conducts electricity, so if the motor or batteries get soaked, they'll short out. Good off nice, steady. Oh. Good effort. It's really good. Surprisingly yeah. stable. Dick and Jen will need to find a better way of waterproofing their electrics than an old plastic bag and cable ties. Okay. I would say that I'd put that down as a, a partial, if not total, success. <laughs> okay, partial, slight success. I think it does show that electric power has it's got a lot to it. It's quite nippy. Yeah, definitely. A slightly more, <laughs> slightly, fractionally more stable craft. Yeah. And I, I would have been away. Jem may have lost the bet, but he's shown that electric boats could be a winner. But they're going to need a motor that is fully waterproof and on a much bigger scale. Alberto wants to base their water taxi on one of the boats that was made in his boatyard. He's lending them a traditional San Pierotta. At over seven meters long, it will easily carry six passengers. But it's going to need a much bigger engine than an electric drill. I can't quite get over that this is the boat that Alberto is lending us. It's gorgeous. But, mate, we're going to really have to look after this. Mm. <laughs> well, in which case, we should take out everything. Absolutely. Let's get rid of anything we're not going to use. I'm yep. definitely not going to use this. Nope, because I wouldn't even know how to. <laughs> The Samparotta was designed to be a fishing boat that could be sailed in the shallow waters of the lagoon. But it's getting a brand new source of propulsion. First, they remove the masts, sails, and rigging. Then they remove the Venetian rollocks and oars used for gondoliering. This is the one thing we don't need. And finally, they take off the two stroke engine that causes all the pollution problems. They know they need to use an electric engine, but they're worried that Alberto wants it to have enough power for a whole day's use. Powering it, OK? It's a long way to Venice. Doesn't matter how you look at it. It's there and back. And if we're not careful, we're going to have a boat full of batteries, and every night he's going to plug in using fossil fuels. We're going to have to use something like solar power, mate. It would be lovely if it was like a self-contained unit, if it had that canopy of solar panels charging the little battery that smooths it all out, that goes to the motor, that drives it along, and he can then go there and back, collecting energy as he goes. Their boat needs to be able to cross the open water to Venice and run for a day. To ensure it has enough power, the solar panels will charge three batteries which will store the energy. But the problem is that the batteries will lose power much faster than the sun can charge them. So Dick and Jem need to fit as many solar panels as they can on the boat. To ensure that the batteries will be charged as quickly as possible, they're manufacturing a tilting mechanism for the solar panels that will help maximize power output. Feel how off balance it is. Oh, that's... Can you hold that? Yeah, if I pull out the, the support. <laughs> Got it. Alberto has lent them a 20,000 euro boat, so they better look after it. All right, looking forward to straightening it up. Ooh, it's quite a tight gap, that one. That is quite tight. Crashing this is just not, <laughs> not, an, not an option, is it? Dick, I'm leaving the floor. 
They'll need to do all the work without damaging it or ruining its looks. Right. Bit more. Yeah, that's cool. Having moved the boat safely, Dick and Gem are still worried about how they're going to fit the large number of solar panels they need. So are you thinking we chuck in two masts of our own... Yep. ..and then build the canopy between the two masts? We're using really strong parts of the boat because that's, you know, this is what it gets propelled by, so those are strong. And this is where the big one goes, and that's got to be solid. What size is the gap? Centre to centre. Yep. You know, the beauty about this idea is... It's going to be retrofitable in any Samperotta. Brilliant. We start uh, turning the mite. Yeah, yeah. We'll get this one finished first. <laughs> <laughs> Dick's doing his research into marine propulsion. The boat they're using is big, so they need a powerful engine. But the more powerful the motor, the quicker it drains its batteries. So to give them enough energy for a whole day's use, they need the most powerful solar panels they can get. The problem is, powerful solar panels are also big and heavy. So will they make their system work on a boat originally powered by sail? Dick's taking responsibility for all the electrics. And Jem is going to tackle the masts and frame to mount them on. Whilst Jem works on the masts, Dick starts working on the solar panels. He's bolting them together so they'll form a canopy. And he's wiring them up so the charge that they create will go straight into the batteries. A solar panel is made up of many individual solar energy collectors called solar cells. These cells are similar to the ones in a battery, but instead of making electricity from chemicals, solar cells generate power by capturing sunlight. When sunlight shines on a solar cell, the energy it carries blasts atomic particles called electrons out of the silicon. The electrons can be forced to flow around an electric circuit and power anything that runs on electricity. Gem's working on the mass that will determine how high the canopy is. But he has a major problem with the measurements and needs to talk it through with Dick. That's our boat. This is the bridge in Venice. And here is the solar panels. Yeah. Tilting, collecting sun, whichever way he's heading. Yeah. Or when he's parked up, collecting loads of sun. Go through a bridge. Oh, well, yeah. The bridges are a bit more like kind of this, if I remember rightly. No, but when you tilt it, hold it, yeah? And you go through. Now, give me high tide. Yeah. Okay. With the boys concerned that they might build a solar canopy too high to get through the bridges, they head into the city of Venice itself to assess the problem. Venice is known as the city of bridges. Most of them are hundreds of years old, and in the last century alone, water levels have risen 25 centimetres, making getting under the bridges increasingly difficult. If the canopy is too high, the boat won't fit under. Alberto's restored water taxi was built before World War II, and in all that time, it hasn't lost its roof under a bridge. You see? Measure it from the water line, then. One and a half metres to the roof. That's 130. Yeah, 130. It's got a 20 centimetre draft. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's not very much at all, is it? It isn't. I think that's just the way they have them around here. Bridges and tides. It's the best benchmark they have. But the water taxi's roof is curved to match the shape of the bridges. The solar panels have to be flat, and there is a risk that they won't fit through. All right, mate. How are your panels coming along? Grand. Yep. Yep, well, that's them. That's as big as it's going to be, mate. And what I've done is that's all six panels together. I've joined these two to make 24 volts because they're 12-volt panels. We yep. need 24 for the uh, batteries for the motor. That's So we've got three banks of 24 volts. And cool. so having got sort of uh, three banks, I'm just going to parallel them all off. So, you know, we, they all stack up yeah. together to charge at 24 volts. So one, two, three, just parallel them. We'll connect them. Sounds great. Two wires come off this for the batteries. Very handy. Well, I'm going to make up a little steel framework that bolts onto here, and then that stiffens all of these lot up. And then we can put the central pivoting shaft down the middle of that. That can go onto bearings on the mast, and then that's kind of ready to go. Good cool. stuff. Yep, won't be long. Jem set to work building the massive frame that will carry all the solar panels and make them tilt. 
Meanwhile, Dick is arranging three waterproof batteries in the back for the motor. The motor is designed to be incredibly efficient. Although its power output is only two horsepower, it generates the same forward force as a six horsepower two-stroke engine. Well, this is going to tie them all together. Dick and Gem have also got to ensure that they don't ruin the looks of the beautiful boat that Alberto has lent them. I know this is the bottom, but this is where the wiring and where the work is. How do we hide that? Although the top side looks smart with its solar panels, the canopy is designed to tilt, and as it does, it will show its bare bottom to the world. If the proud Venetians and demanding tourists are to accept the boat, they'll need to cover it up. What about, and it's maybe a cliché design style in this neck of the woods, but that Italian, Italian ice cream parlour look. You know, it's like a, a kind of red and white and green, is it, for Italian? And then, like, the kind of, like, that goes underneath and the kind of bunting effect around the sides. I think it's got a good cheeky look to it. If, in fact, I have actually seen something. It won't look like that. It's nice and light. Don't rob an ice cream parlour, Dick. Tis. Dick's got a plan. But first, he needs to brush up on his Italian. Uh, my friend. He spotted the sailmakers in the boatyard and hopes they might have some material that could help. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Ciao. Ciao. OK, tutto bene. Mia dizionario italiano inglese um, con figurata. OK? Tut OK. Um, <laughs> didn't mean anything, did it? I didn't understand either. Esuto? Esuto. Esuto, si. um, this big... Che colore? Any colour. So that's nice. Dick's charm has got him three and a half metres of cloth to tidy up their wiring. Cheers. Ciao. Whilst Jem continues working on the canopy frame, Dick sets to work on a control device for the tilting panels. It looks like some sort of 18th century navigation device yeah. as well. We sort of click around and we put it onto the next stage, and of course the panel changes angle. The panel changes angle all the way around. So they move it round, the panel tilts, they move it round the next bit, the panel tilts, and they can just follow the sun. Great. 12 holes in a steel plate mark 15 degree intervals of rotation. By locating the handle at any one of these holes, the panel can be tilted through 180 degrees. It's time to bolt the frame to the solar panels. Each panel weighs seven kilograms. So the total weight of the canopy is over 60 kilograms, and they're mounting it on a flat bottom boat. With all that weight above the water, stability could be a massive problem. Spin it round. Go for it. Hey, sunshine, we'll make electricity now. That's cool. Neither Dick nor Jem are experienced sailors, and they don't know if the heavy canopy will cause the boat to capsize. What works? <laughs> Tomorrow will be its maiden voyage, and they hope the solar panels won't sink their dream. It's the day of the big test, but first they have to assemble the solar panels. Because of the weight of the canopy, they've asked boat builder Mateus to give them a hand. It's not so bad. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Oh. First, the front mast goes in. Right, OK, got it. Got your end? Yep. Now, right, do you want to come in, have to bear with me. Push. Oh, there. Oh, yes. Oh, I'll give you a hand. Sorry, Dick. As they fix the second mast, they find a problem. The heavy solar panels are making the catch of the tilt mechanism too stiff to move. I just have to need to put a bigger handle on it. Yeah. Okay. Also, if it had a big handle, you could put, like, a bending moment on it. Gems run off to the workshop. With a steel rod, he's constructing a longer handle to put more leverage on the catch and counteract the weight of the canopy. Right, that's done. But with the weight of the solar panels already problematic, they can only hope that the canopy isn't going to be an issue on the water. There's just time to wire the solar panels up to the batteries and make sure the masts are wedged in place. Time for a final test. One small mistake with the wiring, and the whole system will have to be rebuilt. Engaged. <laughs> oh, that's all right. 
It's the first test, and Dick wants a backup plan. You get a chance to be a gondolier, mate. Can't be bad. Batteries, motor, solar panels, spare oars. Safety ropes. <laughs> Take it away, Matteo. Good to go. Finally, Dick and Jem launch their solar-powered boat and hope their plans won't be sunk. Jem has never driven a boat before, but as he attempts to steer it towards the jetty, he finds it isn't as easy as it seems. When Alberto arrives, Jem's having serious problems. Within minutes of its launch, Jem has already crashed. Alberto's not impressed, and it's a serious worry. On the test route, they'll meet lots of gondolas. There are over 400 in the city, and they all have right of way over any boats with an engine. If the solar water taxi can't get out of their way, it could cause thousands of euros of damage. Dick and Jem are ready to test their solar-powered water taxi in Venice. Will it be safe? Will it be safe? No, that's a very good question. It's we like have a... got life jackets if we need them. Do you think it will be efficient? Sunshine into the batteries. <laughs> Alberto has designed a marathon test for the solar-powered water taxi. The route will take at least two hours, and they'll encounter open water, bridges, tight canals, traffic, and the ultimate test, a meeting with the head of all of Venice's waterways. To start the test, they head across the open water to the main entrance to Venice. It's a three-kilometer journey and takes them 40 minutes. Venice, without the pollution. Exactly. Straight away, it's a big drain on the batteries. They have to tilt the solar panels to catch the sun as efficiently as they can. But power isn't their biggest worry. With the equivalent of Jem's weight overhead and a flat-bottom boat, they're worried they could get knocked over by a big wave. Yeah, the, 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 it's taking a bit of bump, bump, bump in there, doesn't it? How do you think it's handling with the weight of the solar panels? Oh, I don't think this is going to be a problem. I mean, I feel the boat like having the rig of the sails, maybe even less. They've made it over the dangerous open water. But the second test is what Dick and Jem fear the most. Have they put the solar panels at the right height to get under the bridges? See, I don't know, every time, every time I see a bridge and look at it, I just wonder if this is too high. If the solar panels are damaged by the bridge, they could stop charging the batteries, and they might not have enough power to return home. With just centimeters to spare, the solar panels make it through. And they're quietly confident they can cope with more of the 409 bridges in Venice. But as their route takes them deeper into the city, they face a new challenge. Narrow canals and sharp corners. Jem may have already crashed once, but Alberto has full control of the boat around the tightest of bends. As they cruise around the canals, they're attracting a lot of attention from passers-by. For decades, Venice's motorboats have been dirty and noisy. But this one is clean and quiet. Ciao. Grazie. Grazie. Ciao. What did the gondolier think? Even the gondolier was appreciating because he said we were not guessing and disturbing his guests. Cool. They've traveled four kilometers and have been running for an hour, but they're only halfway through their test. It's important that Dick keeps the solar panels pointing at the sun or they might not make it home and they still have more challenges to overcome. Venice's canals are some of the most congested in the world, and their next challenge is to tackle the city's biggest waterway, the Grand Canal. This is the water taxi's biggest test. How will they cope in the crowded waters? You look that way, I'll look that way, all right? And you look forward. 
Okay? We got it covered. What did he say? It's a nasty blow. Only Alberto's quick reflexes minimize the damage. But it's not all their fault. Gondoliers listen for motors when they go around blind corners. But the quiet electric motor gave no warning. For the second time today, Alberto's boat has been battered. On the roads, you have traffic lights. Exactly. And, like, each way, and but here is nothing. Then you can understand why there are no rules about pollution, about uh, yeah. ecological engines. Yeah. Despite the bruises to his boat, Alberto is still impressed with the solar-powered water taxi. And he heads off to their final test. He's arranged a meeting at City Hall with the man in charge of cleaning up Venice's waterways. The solar-powered water taxi could be what he's looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It'd be great to know what he thinks. If he sees this, he may tell everybody to get one. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. If he isn't impressed, then there'll be no future for Dick and James' creation in Venice. They want to get his blessing. Tell Manuele. Hi, hi. Hi, Manuele. Manuele. He's the Manuele, the man in charge for the city hall and for the whole city of the yeah. traffic in the lagoon. Wow. I'm Dick. Yeah. It's Jen. Hello. What do you think of our solar-powered boat? It's very strange, but it's a very <laughs> interesting boat. The power of the sun for energy, for the engine, it's fantastic. If you perfect the, 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 the system, why not? It's a very, very interesting system. With the blessing from City Hall, it's possible that Dick and Jem's design could prove the basis for a fleet of solar water taxis. To celebrate, Alberto takes them for a drink. Yeah, salute. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank Cheers. You. What do you think the people of Venice think of our boat, your boat? I mean, everybody was looking at us, and everybody was maybe asking, is it really working? Or you have a, a four-stroke engine underneath? <laughs> As they charge their glasses, the solar panel gets a chance to charge up the batteries. Just one hour of charging gives them enough power for the return journey. They've proved that their solar-powered water taxi could easily take on the task of transporting tourists around Venice. It's exactly what Alberto hoped for, but it's only a small step towards solving Venice's massive problems. The boat speed is good, it's similar than the other boats. Yeah. We're not breaking speed limits. And of course, if we head out um, where everybody starts going faster, we haven't got that speed. Dick is worried about its speed. The solar-powered taxi takes 40 minutes to travel from Chitosa to the heart of Venice. Taking its time is fine for tourists, but the locals have a need for speed. And Dick wants to be fast and green. An electric speedboat? Yeah, let's think about that. How many electric speedboats have you ever seen? I've never seen one. I'd love to give it a go. But, like, once boats go quick, there's lots of power. We can do that. Quite honestly, I'll stay in Venice for a couple of days and have a go. That's exactly what I was thinking. If it's an excuse to stay here for a few more days, I'm up for it, Dick. Yeah. Let's make an electric speedboat. Alberto, do you want an electric speedboat? I need it. <laughs> so the boys have committed themselves to a second boat. Thanks to you guys. Yeah, great driving. One down, one to go. Keen to see what they've taken on, they watch the traffic out on the open lagoon. There's a huge difference, isn't there? Because see the big load carriers, they're just ploughing their way through, they're displacing all the displacement going through. And the speedboats, they're up, and it's just literally the tail end, they're planing. That's what we're going to have to achieve. Traditional boats push the water in front of them out of the way, creating a bow wave. But the best way to go fast in a boat is to get it to travel not through the water, but on top of it. This is called planing. By using its motor to push the boat up against its bow wave, a planing boat can then climb over the top of it and skim the water beneath, reducing drag. It can now travel much faster and more efficiently. It just means we're going to have to get A, a very light boat, and B, a phenomenally powerful electric motor. They need a motor at least twice as powerful as the one they use for the water taxi. To get that amount of power, they're going to have to build one from scratch. The first thing they need is a powerful but light electric motor, and Jem's looking for something in the boatyard. But there's nothing that will do the job. Jem's had a brainwave. 
He's got an idea where he might find the perfect engine. But it's on the mainland. I think our quest for lightweight electric drives may just have stopped. <laughs> There seem to be a lot of performance in those, but are they serious? They're very serious. Well, he's particularly serious. He's former electric cart world champion. The other guy <laughs> is the guy that actually builds these things. They've put in the investment and research that gets us to the position where I think we need to be. Under the bonnet is a motor capable of 120 kilometers per hour. It's not that big as well. I mean, 15 kilowatts is a lot of power. Yeah, but the thing is, look at the complexity of it. It's all being controlled by computers. I think we should play with them and see how powerful they are. We might need to spend quite a lot of time testing these. Red or yellow? Uh, red. <laughs> the best way to demonstrate the power of the engines is to drive them. The boys are only allowed to drive the slower cars, but even those have a maximum speed of 90 kilometers per hour. But is it enough to convince Dick that these are the kind of motors that they need? They quickly discover that there is more than enough power for their driving skills. Robert. That's brilliant. <laughs> Did they not teach you how to drive in Ireland? I have no doubt that if we harness this power, we can get a small boat up on the plane. We can, we must do. It's just what Alberta needs. So if I can get a top-end go-kart motor, I think we're onto something. One nil to me. Best of three? Yep. <laughs> Catch you later, Dick. <laughs> Dick and Jem have built a functioning solar-powered water taxi, but now they want to prove that electric boats can also be fast enough to get about quickly. So they're attempting to build Venice's first electric planing speedboat. Dick has been out and got the lightest weight planing hull he can find. It may be limited for space, but it's the perfect size for a nippy electric city boat. Dick, what <laughs> is that? <laughs> On the lagoon, this is scary. But it's small, it's light, it's a planing hole. That thing's ridiculous. If we replace that disgusting two-stroke outboard with a nice electric engine, it'll be completely silent, tiny. It'll be like the ultimate stealth craft. Their plan is to convert the old two-stroke engine to electric power. By removing the polluting two-stroke engine, they're left with the original drive shaft and propeller. Then they'll attach a clean electric motor, connect it to some batteries, and they'll have an emissions-free plug-in-and-go speedboat. But they need to be careful how they attach the new motor to the old outboard. Okay. If we've got some good steel on here yeah. that's bolted to the frame of that, yeah. and then we can then weld from there onto steel plate fitted to the motor, and that's got to be good. I think if we went for a purely rigid coupling, there's too much of a chance of it Agreed. wanting Agreed. to break yeah. itself. So if we buy in a kind of semi-flexible coupling yeah. that can just take up any slight deviations... The alignment of old and new is a problem. The engine and propeller need to be joined by a single shaft. But it will only be strong enough if it's perfectly straight. Even just a fractional error could cause a massive failure. They need a system that will attach the two existing shafts, but will also allow them some movement. A flexible donut-shaped coupling is the solution. All the power should be transferred from the motor, but any dangerous misalignment will be absorbed by the coupling. Dick's using the batteries from the solar-powered water taxi. Each one weighs 18 kilograms, and their position is critical. Because of the space available, Dick has to put one battery in the front of the boat and two at the rear. 
balance is extremely important to planing boats. As the boat tries to climb its bow wave, it has to have enough weight in the front to push its nose down and over the wave. If the boat is badly balanced, it won't plane. Dick starts to weld together the heavy-duty engine mount that will hold a quarter ton of twisting motion. They've attached the flexible coupling with its rubber donut to the electric motor. It's on, mate. That seems to be us. It um, looks so much better than a petrol engine. If you look at that heat there. With a billion components and that, so simple. It's gone forward gear, so with a bit of luck, the propeller should go around. Ready? Here we go. Oh! <laughs> Whoa! Rock solid, it works. I reckon we wire it up, get it on the boat. Good call. Right, just nice. So it's just a case of connecting it to the batteries and trying to keep the water out. And Jam has made a final piece of waterproofing to finish it off. That's, that's like a display case. <laughs> that looks absolutely gorgeous. Now they've got to wait till morning to test it. It's the next day, and time to see if the planet mechanics have solved Venice's polluting need for speed. They've built an electric speedboat. But for it to work, their engine has to deliver a huge burst of power to push it up and on top of the water. If they can't make it plain, then they've failed. Personally, it's a prototype. A life jacket may be a good idea, because we don't know what's going to happen. Do, do we need a crash helmet? <laughs> no. <laughs> if you look here... <laughs> if you get any water, you can bump it out. Alberto gets into the cockpit for the maiden voyage. <laughs> to prove it works, they need to do two test runs, and they're using the full length of the marina. They've increased the amps running to the motor beyond the recommended limit. It's a huge risk, as it could burn out. Alberto gives it full throttle, and he's not happy. You can see he's trying to adjust the weight. He's trying to get the weight further forward. Here he comes, coming back. The boat can't get over its bow wave. It just doesn't have enough power. You can get up. More. Something's not right, so that's not, is it? The dream of an electric speedboat could be over. The question is, has a mechanical failure meant it's underpowered? Or has the engine burnt out trying to do the impossible? The Planet Mechanics have built an electric speedboat, but it's failed its first test. So it's back to the workshop to see what's wrong. They're worried that the electric engine has broken under the strain of trying to plane. Electric boats should be near silent. There's something wrong with the coupling and power is being lost. Do you think this is doing us any good? I used to. I don't anymore. Because obviously it was there to make sure that if we didn't get it exactly lined up, it would take out all the problems, but it seems to be causing more. It's putting more wobble into it than it should be taking out. I think now we should ditch it, and instead of relying on the flexibility to give us some leeway, we should give ourselves no leeway, line it up exactly perfectly, and have a solid connection between the motor and the drive shaft of the propeller. So no... Nothing, nothing flexible at all in the coupling? No, just a perfect alignment. If we don't get it exactly right, something will go badly wrong. The powerful electric motor will subject the drive shaft to the equivalent of a quarter of a tonne of torque. With that amount of twisting motion, they have to make sure that the shafts are perfectly aligned. Any vibrations could rip apart their DIY outboard. It's a lot smoother. If something's to happen, it's going to have to be fairly catastrophic. 
I think it'll be good. Yeah. Let's see what Alberto makes of this. Alberto, how are we doing? Hey, guys. Yeah. Thank you for coming back. I think it's fixed. It's as strong as we're going to make it, yeah? And uh, if anybody's going to get it up on the plane, it's going to be you. We're ready for it. You're responsible for proving that high-speed electric boats are OK. It's going to work. You have to think of yourself as a bloke who's going to prove all this for us now. OK, here we go. Put you straight in. The sun is setting. Alberto doesn't have much time. They're worried that the engine might not be strong enough. But to get the boat onto the plane, Alberto will need to give it all the power it has. When he hits full power, the engine will produce a quarter of a ton of force, easily powerful enough to tear the prop shaft apart. He might only have one chance. So despite the dangers, Alberto tries to get his weight as far forward as possible. His weight on the nose will help push the boat over the bow wave. But it's gone very quiet. But it's all or nothing. Here, come on. Will the engine have enough power to push the boat on the plane, or will it rip itself apart trying? Alberto speeds around the corner on Venice's first electric speedboat. That, that's looking like it. On the second run, it has power to spare. Hey. <laughs> Dick and Jem have shown Alberto that electric engines can be used to power speedboats, and there's no need for dirty two-stroke engines. Oh, but a San Perotto is, like, really good feeling. Yeah. But that's just amazing. And, look, it sits back down now. OK, <laughs> you got up. Hey, you've been home. Yeah, I'm getting these brakes. <laughs> did, you, did you think we were going to do it? <laughs> yes, absolutely, we did it. You yeah. did? You did it. Yeah, no, no, I mean, you did a great job. <laughs> Both is working. I'm almost dry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Cheers. Thank you. Let's go for a beer. <laughs> it's calling our tune. Dick and Jen came to Venice and were shocked by the filth caused by boat engines. So by using an historic boat and 21st century technology, they created a solar-powered water taxi. And by building Venice's first electric speedboat, they've proved that without sacrificing speed, Venetians could kick the habit of combustion engines. Not bad for a couple of landlubbers. All aboard, Jim. Right, let's go then. Next stop, Blighty. Next stop, who knows where? Just think of the difference if everybody had one of these. I only need to think of that bucket full of oil nice. after we uh, stuck the two-stroke in there. Bring on the next challenge. Arrivederci.